So I'm not a sitter when I talk, so I'm going to stand just because it helps me inflect my voice a little bit more. Um, and it really is a pleasure for me to be here. I've had um, all of us who work deeply in the NIH trenches sometimes get, um, I think, emotionally exhausted <laughs> from um, much of the many of the things we need to do just to keep things going. And it really is wonderful for me to have a chance to talk with many of you who have done such groundbreaking work in the area of HIV prevention and treatment. And particularly uh, uh, today, presentation is very much slanted to, to the huge lessons that I've learned personally. You might think I'm a, I'm a very strange person. I'm a bacteriologist who lives in OBGYN and microbiology and molecular genetics, but also have become quite um, convinced that the marriage of disciplines of understanding behavioral and social science as it relates to HIV prevention in particular is absolutely going to be critical to our success. And I think um, uh, the lessons we have learned have completely changed the way that we've done business in terms of the way we design and manage our studies. And so today I'd really like to talk about those lessons. So I'm going to just give you some quick snapshots of the basics and current status of microbicides. I'm going to spend some time talking about tenofovir gel because that's where we've learned many of our lessons, especially as it related to the study called VOICE. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about vaginal rings or sustained delivery methods for delivering ARVs. I'm going to talk about rectal microbicides, which are not just for men. And I will talk about sort of what to keep your eyes open for uh, as for news around the corner. So I think most people know that a microbicide, which I think is a horrible name. Um, I don't know. Zena, who came up with that name? We came up with viruside. Yeah, you had viruside. We had to give on that, and they leaned on us to change the name. Well, who was the they? Oh, it was Chris Elias. And CDC. Because mm. you know, microbicide, no, no woman ever woke up and said, gee, I would like a microbicide for my vagina. <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right, well, you know, because I always make fun of the name and I never know who to blame. So it's Chris Elias and the CDC people. I'm, I'm glad to get to the source because I know you guys used to call it viruside. All right. But it's basically just a product, and we have to find a better name for it, that's designed to prevent or reduce sexual transmission of HIV or other STIs when applied inside the vagina or rectum. Most that are in late stage testing contain ARVs. There are some antibody-based microbicides and some uh, like probiotic lactobacillus type uh, microbicides that are in earlier phase development. But they can be formulated a lot of different ways. as a gel, as a vaginal ring, as quick dissolving tablets, or the thing that we work on a lot, which are these vaginal films. And but, but most of the rectal microbicides, or all of them right now, are lubricant-like gels, although there are some is some work ongoing with the development of douches. Um, and I'll talk just briefly about that at the end. And microbicides in the beginning, the idea was to get something that could be applied at the time of sex. Um, but there are lots of different ways they've been used now, daily, with sex, and then there are the newest uh, kinds of gel and ring, the ring formulations that could be used for up to three months at a time. So it really is quite, uh, there's quite a range of use patterns. So why microbicides? Um, receptive partners, I think everyone understands, have the least control over condom usage. And we know that the receptive partners are much more vulnerable. We still recognize that globally, um, it's really tragic, actually. I was reviewing these data yesterday. The leading killers of women, young women, are domestic violence and AIDS. Um, and I would say the two are highly related uh, as well, uh, the it disempowered uh, women globally. The risk of infection as well from unprotected anal sex is as much as 20 times greater, although I will have to say I'm working with large populations of women in sub-Saharan Africa and talking with communities there. It's amazing that there's very little discussion about anal sex, even though about 15% of women in the Durban area report having anal sex, um, that there are people, though, 
uh, groups we've talked to there report to us that they believe anal sex is clean sex. You can't get pregnant from it. And that, in fact, there's a lot, there's almost no community education surrounding anal sex as a risk factor in high risk young women. And we really don't know the contribution of anal sex to HIV in young women there. And we're hoping to shed more light on that because that has a huge impact on how effective vaginal microbicides would be. But the whole idea behind a microbicide is really super simple is you put lots of drug at the point of transmission without having systemic levels of drug. And so you have less systemic toxicity. You don't have, in some cases, the stigma associated with oral antiretroviral use without having, but having uh, much higher levels of a uh, drug locally. And we understand that this is always within the context of uh, condoms, but important to realize that most receptive uh, partners don't control their use. And certainly we hear from the women in our studies that they start having sex, a round of sex, as they call it, with their partner, but sometime during the middle of that sex act, the part condom comes off and, and they just don't control their own exposure. So the Microbicide Trials Network, which I co-lead with my partner, work partner, which is Ian McGowan, have a mission to develop safe and effective vaginal microbicides, safe and effective rectal microbicides. We're also pushing very hard on combination products that could jointly protect against pregnancy and HIV in a single product. And that's something we've gotten very, very interested in and has really been driven very much by what we're hearing from study participants, that they really would welcome a product that was a family planning product. And I'll talk just very briefly about that in a minute. But we've really focused on meeting the unmet needs of special populations. Um, we've done tenofovir gel studies in pregnant and breastfeeding women. We are doing a clinical study right now of the depivirin ring in 14 to 17 year olds, which I have to tell you has been quite a workout. Um, Postmenopausal women who are actually quite delightful to work with. They show up for their appointments <laughs> and are much easier to work with than the, the, uh, the, the young adolescents. But it's actually the first um, microbicide study ever done in postmenopausal women. It's been quite interesting looking at the challenges with using vaginal products in women not on estrogen, any kind of hormonal estrogen therapy vaginally, and what that has meant for them in terms of comfort. And then we do studies as well in uh, obviously MSM, but transgenders as well, and, and particularly in MTN017, the rectal microbicide study we're doing right now, we have a uh, small, but I would say important uh, contribution from transgenders. And we're just beginning to develop a study to look at uh, the safety of vaginal products in P uh, transgenders with a neovagina. So we, we do, in fact, try to work in um, what we consider populations that whose needs aren't currently being met by other um, kinds of interventions. So just just to catch you up, there, I think you all know this, there's no microbicide yet approved, but there are two vaginal microbicides in late stage clinical testing. There's tenofovir gel, and that is uh, being evaluated in something called the FACS001 study, which is being co-led by Helen Rees and uh, Glenda Gray in South Africa. It's been completed and we're, I think, supposed to hear the results at CROI in February. And then there's the depivirine ring, which is a silicone ring. Um, and there are two uh, concurrent studies, one called Aspire, which I'll talk a fair bit about. And there's a second one called the ring study. Um, and then essentially uh, the third kind of major thing that's ongoing is rectal microbicide study. It's the first phase two study uh, ongoing ever of a rectal microbicide. It's just completed enrollment and it's testing a different formulation of tenofovir gel. So why do we need these, or why are we working so hard to do this, and why are you having to listen to this? Um, and I'll, I hope that you understand by the end how, how sincere I am when I say that, actually, I, I think the work you do has influenced us so much in the way we've moved forward. What we really understand is like, as in the field of contraception, that if you maximize your choices, you can optimize your effectiveness. We know that having a single kind of anything 
just doesn't work as well. And I always think about this when I walk into a store and I look at all the different kinds of moisturizing conditioners for your hair. You know, clearly there's not a huge amount of difference, but we all love our certain products, right, to the point we carry them with us when we travel because we like a certain thing and that's what we use. And certainly we know in the contraceptive field that having a range of options so that if people don't like one thing, they can use another has been absolutely central to bringing down the rates of unintended pregnancy, along with the longer acting uh, types of formulations. And what we've learned is that I think biomedical researchers sit around sometimes and we think about stuff that might work, but we don't think about products that people might want. And we have somehow conflated the notion that if something was effective and available that they would want it and use it, when in fact what we really need to understand is what people want in their lives. And I know that's obvious to all of you, but not so obvious sometimes to the biomedical researchers who have sat around constructing these really uh, complex interventions. What we've learned in study after study when we talk to women wherever they are, is that some people really love a ring, some people really hate a ring, some people really like a gel, some people really hate a gel, some people really like film, some people really hate films, but the bottom line is most people can find something they like, but not everybody is going to like one thing. And so we've really tried to think a lot more earlier in development about what is going to excite people as a, a product. So let's start with Tanoff of your gel and its story, because it's quite an interesting one. Um, and I would say certainly the champion of Tanoff of your gel has been uh, Salem and Croatia, Abdul Karim, um, who very well known to you, of course, um, who really um, were the, some of the first people to champion this. It was developed by Gilead Sciences, which gave a royalty-free license to two groups, the International Partnership for Microbicides and Conrad back in 2006. And it was the first antiretroal-based microbicide. And it was basically just, they took a fairly standard vaginal gel and added tenofovir. It wasn't a fancy or well, what can I say, well-designed formulation. And basically, it was what was the first thing, though, that was available. And it's been evaluated for effectiveness in three studies, Caprisa 04, Fax, and uh, Voice. So just to remind everyone, and I think most people in the room are aware of this, the Caprisa study was really quite um, a landmark in that it was the first to establish a proof of concept uh, for a topically-based microbicide. So about 900 women funding uh, through Conrad and USAID and the South African government. And what they showed was that in the placebo-treated women, the incidence of HIV infection in these communities in Durban, there was one rural and one urban community, was about 10%, 10% incidence. And in the women who received the active product, there was 39% fewer infections. So there were 60 infections in the placebo gel group, 38 in the tenofovir gel group. So essentially, there are kind of really a couple of important things here. Is that one, it was the first study that worked, but the incidence was incredibly high. When this study got done and, and, P, and the women went off product, and then they waited a couple years, were able to get everybody back, for the post-trial access protocol called Caprisa 08. What they found was that the incidence in, of HIV in that group of women remained at 10% per year for the next two years. So all the behavioral counseling, all the condom provision, the STI testing, all of that, and having participated in a study, everybody always says, once you're in a study, the incidence just goes down from all the good things that happen. In this instance, I think these young women still were at 10% per year for those next two years. So that's what's really important to understand. I was listening to a talk on Monday on World AIDS Day. Bob Redfield was there, and he was talking about the incidence of HIV really coming down and coming under control. And globally, it's true. We've seen a significant reduction. But we've not seen one iota of change in the incidence of HIV in the young at-risk women at all in these sites. And so I think it's still to us an important gap that hasn't been addressed by current, currently available um, prevention methods. So this study, I think, really paved the way a lot of interest. And there were some really uh, important sidebars to this study. 
in Caprisa, what they showed, which was, uh, uh, I call it the ODA moment, yes, there was more reduction in HIV in people who were more adherent. And they basically got the applicators back from women who were in this study, and they looked to see whether or not they looked like they'd been inserted. So it was a low-tech method. But they found that in those where adherence was in excess of 80%, they had a 50% reduction. And there was a serendipitous finding that uh, women who were in the tenofovir gel group had a 50% reduction in HSV2. And I will say that we just were able to document that as well in the voice trial, in that women who were on the tenofovir gel group who had high adherence also had a 50% reduction in HSV2. That was reported at the Research for Prevention meeting. So I think that's quite real. And so it means that this single agent is sort of a multi-purpose agent because it can block both HIV and HSV. But there were a lot of questions after this. It was obviously a phase two study, phase two B study, not a phase three. Wasn't sufficient to support licensure of tenofovir gel. And so one of the questions was, um, could it be replicated in a second study? And that was really the genesis of the FACT001 study. Um, could this support licensure? Now, importantly, in the Caprice study and in the FACT study, women were asked to use tenofovir gel sometime in the 12 hours before they had sex and then a, to apply a second dose in the 12 hours after sex. This was the so-called BAT24 regimen. I always thought that sounded kind of like Batman. It was kind of cool, you know, BAT24. But um, the bottom line is um, some people thought, well, you know, when we saw these data, I have to say that we thought, well, 39% is pretty good, 50%, but maybe it could be even better if it was daily. And so we asked the question, how about daily use of tenofovir gel? And there's a study that Jessica Justman and I participated on together called HPTN 059, where we looked at daily versus coital use of tenofovir gel. And at least in that study, uh, women reported that either was actually quite acceptable. And uh, we found that, um, that, so based on that, we decided to taste the, test the daily use regimen. But the FACT001 study, as I mentioned, is a phase three study looking at that BAT24 regimen. Uh, it's being conducted by a South African consortium of researchers formed following the Caprice results, and those results are going to be available uh, probably at CROI next year, and we're all looking forward to hearing those results. So when, if in fact this does work, these two studies together, the FDA package will include for licensure the FAX001 and the Caprisa data. And so Conrad is actually compiling the regulatory package to put that in. So if we talk about then daily use of tenofovir gel, this was a study that we designed back in uh, literally 2005 uh, before the microbicide trial network was uh, funded. And it was, we called it voice, vaginal and oral interventions to control the epidemic. And it was really to try to get at that question, what would work better for young women, oral prep, oral tenofovir, oral truvada, or uh, topical prep, that is uh, topical tenofovir. So this study, um, I would say we were filled with hope, um, somewhat naive about the population we were working in, in as much as we decided, um, because the epidemic is most profoundly uh, high in young and married women, we really focused on recruitment of women who were 90% unmarried and m more than half were less than 25 years of age. So we did that quite deliberately. Um, we, this was funded by the U.S. NIH uh, and led by Mike Chirenji at the University of Zimbabwe and Jeannie Morazzo. And it was really proposed very early on. And I'm really proud. One of the things wh that happened, I, I think everyone knows that people say voice didn't work. Um, I'm going to tell you a lot about some of the crazy things I've heard about voice didn't work. Um, people have said, you know, it always cracks me up, people go out to dinner after a meeting like this and you have some bright-faced young person who leans across the table and said, did you ever think about doing community consultations before you did the study? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, shit, I forgot that. No. Um, <laughs> So we, I want you to know that, you know, this is a, um, I'm really proud of actually the way we did voice. We did, had stakeholder consultations all over. We actually brought in people from all the countries in which we were going to work. 
and you know about doing this study and the stakeholders were really enthusiastic they said oh yeah we think this is like the, exactly the right kind of study to do and the main things that they were worried about were emergence of resistance uh, to tenofovir and whether or not we could use PCR to detect acute seroconversion so people wouldn't be on too long those were the main concerns raised by stakeholders from Zimbabwe Uganda and uh, South Africa and then we did that actually before we made the protocol. So we actually went and got input from stakeholders and then we went to a protocol development meeting which we held in South Africa and at that meeting we actually had uh, people from behavioral scientists, we had um, CAB members from every single site we were going to work with. They actually designed much of the protocol and they designed one of the sub-studies which I'll talk about in a second. But the bottom line is from the very outset, way before we actually went to NIH and got funding, we did a tremendous amount of groundwork engaging social scientists. So it, we ended up with this sort of suite of three studies, VOICE, VOICE-C, and VOICE-D. So VOICE, the parent study, had 5,029 women in three countries, Zimbabwe, Uganda, and South Africa. There were 15 clinical research sites. We had a study called VOICE-C, which stood for Voice for Community. And it was one that was actually designed uh, jointly by the behavioral scientists in um, the VOICE study as well as the community working group. And they said they really wanted to understand what the household and community factors were that uh, affected adherence and uh, study participation. And then there's a third one called Voice D, which is, I'll tell a little bit more about, but it has also been incredibly useful to helping us understand what happened in Voice. And it was actually designed after we had the uh, closure of the tenofovir gel arm. So in terms of timelines, um, we have the voice started in 2009. We started voice C in uh, June of 2010. Our DSMB stopped the oral tenofovir arm on September 9-11 um, of 2011. And then on November 11th, it stopped the uh, tenofovir gel arm. And then the study came to a conclusion here, which and it stopped them because uh, they were found to be uh, not effective. And then essentially we started, we conducted voice C concurrently with voice and then we started this voice D study which was to go back and interview study participants about what was going on. And so I'll talk quite a bit about that. So what happened in voice? Um, well, first of all, um, when you look at this, you can see very clearly that the incidence of HIV in women less than 25 years of age in South Africa was 8.7, our highest incident site was around 11, um, but overall almost 9. So very, very similar to what SLIM had found in the Caprisa uh, populations. Uh, if you were more than 25 years old and you lived in South Africa, it was about half that. If you were married, it was 0.9. If you were unmarried, it was 7.5. And so our first surprise really was that incidence was a lot higher than we expected. People had told us going into the study, well, there's a huge rollout of ARVs now, huge treatment programs through PEPFAR in South Africa. These communities have great penetration for treatment. You're going to see much lower incidence, which is one of the reasons the study was so large. We actually were told we needed to increase our sample size from 4,000 to 5,000 because our incidence was going to be low. So first surprise. Um, unfortunately, incidence is really very, very high, especially in young unmarried women. So what we saw for results in this study were um, very interesting and, and I think also a lesson. When we look at um, the results show that the products were safe but not effective, but what we saw was that an effectiveness for oral tenofovir of minus 49%, we actually hit a p-value in the univariate of tenofovir being harmful which is what makes you understand that when you get, like it had it been in the other direction, everybody would have been jumping up and down for happiness. But the bottom line is you can get quirky things happening even in randomized trials. We haven't still figured out why these women did worse, but that's why that arm studied stopped first. With oral Truvada, which went to the bitter end, we saw absolutely no protective benefit. The only thing we did see a protective benefit for was the gel, tenofovir gel. 
uh, we saw a 15% effect size, but obviously did not anywhere close reach statistical significance. So surprise number two, uh, women randomized to products we knew worked from Partners Prep and IPREX and the Caprice study obviously were not associated with reduction in HIV. And so then people asked us in the third set of questions that I loved, well, did you guys look at adherence at all during this study? We're like, Chase, I wish we would have thought of that. Um, <laughs> and it's safe to say we poured everything we had at the time into understanding adherence. We um, essentially, at the clinics, we got the, the pill bottles back or the applicators back, and we counted how many there were. And we did this whole VASP intervention, this patient-centered uh, counseling program after the IPREX study came out and Reve Amico's work showed that that had been very, they thought very effective for them. We did this whole retraining of all the counselors with motivational counseling. We did a CASI um, in local language um, and uh, people could listen to headphones and answer the questions in their local language. We even made it so that it was available for numerically illiterate people. And then we had the whole Voice C program, which I mentioned about before. And essentially, we had this whole suite of things. And when we looked at what people were telling us throughout the study, uh, based on returned pill or applicator counts, 92% of people said they were using their Truvada tablets. 87% of people said they were using their Tenofovir tablets. 86% said they were using their Tenofovir gel, which correlated really nicely with what they were telling us in self-report. And they were doing that do these ACASI interviews as well as other interviews. But when we actually went back and at the end of the study were able to get drug levels, what we found was that essentially only less than 30% of people actually ever use product, well, use product at their quarterly visits. The percentage of women with no drug detected in any sample, so we did about eight or 10,000 samples, there were over half of people who never at any of their quarterly visits ever had any drug. Yes. For the gel use, what's the what is the expected drug? The expected drug level for gel use is less than for oral. Yeah, definitely, it's way less than for oral, but um, you can still detect it within 24 hours. You can't detect it for as many days, but you can at least know that on the and if they said it's a daily use program, so if they said they used it yesterday and we didn't find any, we know they didn't use it yesterday. Okay. But good point. But our surprise number three, and this I think was the most devastating to us when we sat in the room and we looked at this data. We said, oh my God, you know, we, they came back. Our retention overall in the study was 91%. Okay? So women came back month after month after month, telling us the same fairy tales <laughs> every month. Um, and they basically, um, they weren't using the product. These are some data from Erin van der Straten that she reported at Croy, and this was like a question we asked by a Cassie. Um, what, how do you judge your own ability to use product as instructed in the past four weeks when they came in for their monthly visit? And you can see that huge proportions, 69, you know, I mean high proportions of people who said, oh, they were excellent, are very good, were completely non-adherent, okay? So lots of questions. Why didn't women really use the study products? Why did they sign up for the study, come back dutifully every month, month after month for two years, and actually not use the study products? And why did they go to such great lengths to hide their non-use from us? You know, why, why did they? One of my favorite things we found in the interviews later were the women who said, I love the calendars they gave us to keep track of how much study drug we had because I could use that to calculate how many I should throw away um, so that my answers on the return count would match the interview. So. Why did they join the study if they never really wanted the products? What happened to all those damn products? Um, you know, we spent millions of dollars doing uh, packaging, labeling, shipping, showing that they're stored in exactly the right way, uh, ensuring that they're of the highest standards. 
why didn't they use the products even after they were told? During the study, we had the results from the partners prep study where it was 75% uh, effective, 70% effective. We had the IPREX results. We had the Caprisa results. And each of every time, those women were informed when they came back, you know, these products, if you use them, they really work. So there were multiple times. We've gone back and looked over time at adherence when there were an announcements and absolutely no change. Absolutely no bump at all. And why were they so engaged with the study, but so unengaged with the products? I mean, clearly, I mean, people have said, oh, maybe they didn't understand they were at risk. But I, I think that's way too simple. And so we've spent a ton of time thinking about these questions. I mean, what do you guys think? Why were they so engaged in the trial if they didn't want to study products? What were the incentives for participating? Okay, so what were the incentives for participating? Well, they got um, some money, you know, it's 15 or $20, depending on where they were every month. So that was, that was actually not insignificant. They got, th this is what I think was more significant, though. They got access to great health care. They got, S the women said, oh, I loved getting the STI screens. I liked getting the monthly HIV tests. I love that I could get pap smear screening. If my kid was sick, I could bring them in and they would take care of my kid. These were people who didn't have access to very good health care. And they felt, and they did, got great access to health care and social services. So they, they loved it. And so we, I guess we should feel really proud that we <laughs> provided great health care. Um, it has been, uh, you know, this sort, even if you don't use these products, you're now part of the system. So Anka, you're exactly right. People thought, you know, if you're part of this study, I mean, one, one of the interviews, and I have to say I've become a, a, an obsessive reader of qualitative interviews now uh, from these study participants. One woman um, talked about, she said, you know, I used to, and several actually said this, um, I used to worry a lot about HIV, but I came in every month, and every month my test was negative. And I wasn't using the product. So what I was doing being in the study was working for me. And I could give my drugs to my brother who has HIV. So they felt very good. They were getting good, um, essentially, feedback that they were staying HIV negative with monthly tests, even though they knew they were non-adherent. And they were doing a good thing by giving their drugs away to somebody else who they felt needed it. It's very interesting. What else? Why didn't they start using? Yes, go ahead. I'm imagining what's the market value for ARVs in, in some of these places. So the question is, what's the market value for these ARVs and were people selling them? Yes, there were some people selling the ARVs, um, although I don't think that was huge. Um, but, I mean, these look exactly, you know, tenofovir looks like tenofovir they get too. And so essentially we know that they, some people said they were giving them away and some people were selling them. Uh, strangely enough, we also found some people were selling the tenofovir gel. Uh, it was thought to lighten the skin and also improve skin and hair. So we know some ended up in hair as well. So did some people think that, I mean, they understood that this was treatment for, for HIV, so they were giving it to like friends or family who had HIV? Yeah, absolutely. People understood that these were ARVs and that they were the same ARVs used for treatment. Um, yes. I wonder whether in some regions um, where people have been, or people in surrounding communities have been through a lot of microbicide tri trials and it failed, whether there also was this sense that, oh, we know this stuff doesn't work anyway. Um, actually, we didn't get any sense that women were cynical about the prospects that this would work. And actually, when we had the meetings with participants when the study went down, the women in the room who were adherent but had suspected the other women of being non-adherent because of the gossip in the, they started yelling. There were almost fights breaking out at the sites. It's your fault. This stuff, you've deprived of us of, of a product that could work. It's your fault because you didn't take it. I was taking it, but you didn't take it. It's your fault. And in Uganda, there was almost a, a riot at the site amongst the women uh, who were very angry with one another. Yes? I just have a question. Um, 
question. Yeah. Is, um, your test of adherence, um, only because Alex just told me one thing, <laughs> but um, the gel it is captures how much time and the pill captures how much time? You might have said this in a minute. Yeah, no, I mean, the, uh, the, in terms of adherence based on plasma levels, it's, it's a very incomplete test of adherence. Uh, probably with the pill, it's a, a week. With the gel, it's about a day. Um, but, you know, we knew that since these were daily products, we, we can tell, like in the oral groups, that essentially they clearly hadn't used any pill for a, a week. Yeah. So it's not just that they didn't have sex, you know, and want to use the pill. No, these were daily. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. So another reason why women might join the trial and not use the study product kind of related to the issue of healthcare is really the relationship with the staff. And I think we've learned, I remember in New York City with the early perinatal transmission studies that happened that, again, it was this bonding of women with the staff and coming all the time that was really a benefit for them. Right. No, I think you're exactly right that there are huge uh, benefits. Women have told us that it changed their lives, they became much better at taking care of themselves, that there are huge benefits to study participation and people felt basically I think they could get all the benefits without taking the risk. So a couple more and then we'll keep going. I wonder if the political plan climate also played a role. I know that Zimbabwe and Uganda had a very, the government has a very anti-US stand, mm. anti-Western world stand, so maybe they saw this clinical trial as another anti-West kind of against that anti-West. Yeah, maybe. I think it, was there an anti-West thing? Maybe we were pretty careful that each you know each clinical site is run by Africans, and the sites are all African, and they you know. But the consent form does say this money comes from the United States. I don't think that that was overall, I think there's a huge distrust of, of research in general and a misunderstanding, but I didn't, in all the interviews I read, ever say these crazy Americans are, you know, to blame. Yeah. Were there culturally, sort of culturally based beliefs about um, or feelings about taking chemicals? In the I mean, yeah, thank you for, uh, were there culturally based beliefs about uh, taking drugs, absolutely. One of the things we learned uh, very clearly is that people believe that if you took ARVs, you gained weight, for example, mm -hmm. you know, which is true if you have AIDS. Um, and that if when they took the ARVs, they were more hungry. And they, and they believed that since they were taking ARVs that they needed more food and they said they didn't take them because they couldn't afford to buy the food because they needed to buy the food because it was making them hungry because they needed to gain weight. There were a lot of beliefs um, about like this because the consent form said you know you might have liver problems or kidney problems that they might get liver or kidney problems and then they would um, or they might break their bones because it could cause a decreased bone density and so why take those risks? Yeah. Yes. The question. The issue is that I mean, the beauty of voice, of course, it was placebo-controlled study. But did you ask the women at the end if they thought they were on placebo or on drug? Um, yeah, we did ask women at the end if they thought they were on placebo or on drug, and people guessed. Uh, uh, yeah, about 50-50. So it, it wasn't, actually people were very bad at guessing that they were on placebo. I'll talk more about that in a second. Anyway, so the Voice C study, which was uh, was an exploratory sub-study, as I mentioned, designed at the very outset of Voice using multiple qualitative research methods at um, the Johannesburg site. And so we, for this study, did 102 in-depth interviews we also did ethnographic interviews as well as focus group discussions on 102 participants. We did in-depth in interviews and focus group discussions with 22 male partners of vo voice participants. We did focus group discussion with 17 CAB members and then we also reached out to 23 key community stakeholders uh, with a focus group discussion. And so this is something you know better than me, but essentially trying to touch on resources, families, friends, product attributes, side effects, all the way out to, to community factors like norms and beliefs. And what we found in, in at least this one site was that many women joined Voice for Health health services and health reasons. And that getting all those clinical services contributed to a sense of well-being 
and the products themselves were perceived as things for sick people and they felt pretty healthy and they were we were telling them every month they were HIV uninfected and so why would you use them because they were products for sick people there was selective disclosure um, to their partners and family members about um, whether or not they were t uh, about being on this study and this was to mitigate social risk a lot of several people said you know when I had these ARVs and my family members saw them they thought I must be infected and I hadn't told anyone and so I had to tell them no I was not really HIV positive and so you know I gave them to someone else so they could see I really wasn't HIV infected uh, because partners, friends, and family all question product use. The, so clearly, even though um, the communities, there'd been a lot of education, there was still a lot of concern about why are you taking these products if you're not sick. And then there was a lot of ambivalence um, towards the research. They valued the clinical services and the environment, but they did have concerns about the trial safety and legitimacy and these were really fueled by stories in the waiting room in the community about what was happening in the studies. One of the things we find relentlessly in sub-Saharan Africa are issues related to witchcraft. We collect blood, the blood, some of it comes to the United States, why are the Americans taking the blood and sending it to them back to America? Why is it they want our blood? It has to be witchcraft. We, we get that all the time even now. Um, but there's also a lot of concerns about um, not so much that we were wanting people to get HIV infected but maybe the drugs weren't safe or they would be tested here. We also did this other voice D, the behavioral study and after early disclosure uh, closure of both the vaginal and oral tenofovir arms of voice we decided we really needed to dig into the study populations and find out what was going on a little bit more broadly than we saw from voice C. So we really wanted to explore why uh, there was a dilution of efficacy. And so um, then we had a second stage which was a uh, stage two is designed to actually take the PK results and go back to people and say okay you told us you used it all the time here's your actual results how do you feel about that. That's been very interesting. <laughs> so from the stage one participants, um, not surprisingly, people have all said, oh no, actually, I, other people didn't use it, but I used it all the time. Um, they suggested that uh, when we asked them, well, what could we have done different? They said, you should have brought us our blood test and told us our results and then made us be honest about it. Um, we also heard that people said, you know, they didn't understand what we meant by adherence. Um, they, they said, um, well, I came every week, I answered your questions, I gave you my blood, I was very adherent. But did you take the product? No. <laughs> and so they, they felt like, you know, if they were doing 90% of the stuff we asked, um, essentially they were doing a good job. And so they really didn't understand the rating scales. Now for the stage two approach to get back to getting the, the results and going back to the participants, we went to 131 former voice participants who had been on product at least um, three months. We pre-selected these based on people who either had low, intermediate, plus or minus, or high um, use of the, the products and we selected people from both the tablet and the gel group and we did in-depth interviews and then we did focus group discussions only with the inconsistent or low product adhering um, people. And so there was this notion that presenting women with their drug results could generate more candid discussions and that, um, that when we presented these data to them, they would be more forthcoming about why they didn't use it or what they did with the products and what was important to them about non-use. And helping us understand why they came back all the time but they didn't actually use the products. And so Arian and her colleagues and did this great thing, Arian van der Straten, where they, and there was endless numbers of um, teleconferences about this, how do you explain uh, to people adherence over time? And so they came up with what they called the teapot tool. Um, and so basically what they showed them was like you could make like if we looked every day at what was happening did you have lots of did you have tea every day 
So if you were high, you had tea every day and your cups were always full. If you were inconsistent, you would look kind of like this, or if you had non-adherence, your teapot was, was empty. And so they created this visual tool to use with study to participants to explain that we had selected many visits over time and we wanted to show them what kind of pattern of adherence they had. So what we found was actually people understood this extremely well, which was, I thought, great. Um, but it was very interesting reading these interviews, I have to say. Um, some people were completely offended. They said, no, I am in the wrong category. We would, you know, you have told me I am here, but I am not here because I actually didn't take the products all the time. Or we would say, you are here, and they'd say, oh, no, that can't be true. I really was taking the products. So there was some of that. But in general, people said, well, I tried it a little bit. I stopped after a while. But sometimes I took it just before study visits to try to um, make sure that you guys would find it if you looked. Um, a lot of people said, you know, I really did take it, but it was so hard if I was drinking or um, I was taking other medication or that I was drinking, I really took it, but the alcohol must be <laughs> that I was drinking actually interfered with the, with the test. Um, and many people said, well, I think it was just placebo, and so you have me in the wrong group because I wasn't having symptoms and side effects. So people were so strongly believing, you know how, you know, I love those ads on TV all the time. You know, like you see something and then the guy talks really fast, blah, 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 blah. you know, you could have palpitations or heart disease or you could end up dying. Um, <laughs> but other than that, it's great. <laughs> but when we can send people on to these investigational drug studies, we spend a lot of time and put it in writing. Like this is all the stuff that could happen to you. And many, many, many women said, I wasn't having any of those side effects. So I was getting placebo, so I didn't take it. And then when we told them, look, you were on the active drug, they were astonished, absolutely astonished, because we'd spent so much time telling them all the bad things they should be feeling. And uh, others said, well, you must have tested me when I was pregnant. So, you know, it was very interesting. When This is one that I've pulled out, and I've used several times, so Pro-Off has seen it a couple times, but this was one that really uh, spoke to me. Uh, this woman said she, she was in Zimbabwe. She, mo she said she was motivated to join the study because her husband had left her and she decided to have multiple partners to take care of her bills. She was happy to get randomized to either the gel or the tablet because she felt she'd be protected. However, over time, she realized she was not getting any side effects and that most women were talking about these side effects. And so she began to think she'd been put in the placebo arm. So she said, I was thinking I was in the placebo group and getting the color only and not the drug. So she was demotivated and she said, sometimes I didn't bother to take the tablets because it was a placebo. And when she talked about this with other women in the waiting room, there was a story that was circulating that a woman developed a rotten liver and many stu study participants came to visit this woman to hear her story. And when she was asked what she did with her products, and there, actually there was no rotten liver case, I want you to know, in Zimbabwe, so it was, a, it was a fictitious story. When asked what she did with the product, she said she kept it in her house in case they would be approved one day, and then she would still have something good. Now this woman, would any amount of motivational counseling have made any damn difference? Arian van der Stratton says, you know, in voice we did motivational counseling to wear your shoes when they had already decided never to put shoes on. And so the motivational counseling was completely, uh, it was not useful at all simply because I think people had not engaged at all with the notion of using these products. She suggested for future trials that reimbursement should be removed. And we heard this from lots of people that you shouldn't actually pay us. You should just come and pick us up and take us to the clinic. But people are joining the study because they want the money. When asked why she stayed on this study alongside all the women who were not using the study products, she said, it's because I like the money. <coughs> she also said, stayed, she stayed on the study because it forced her to get tested every month, which was something she welcomed. And she wouldn't have done it hadn't she, had she not been in the study. And the free health checks, the pap smears, were also an added an incentive as these are expensive. So if you think about it, we sit with our 
participants and say, we don't know if the product works, so you really have to use condoms. You might be getting the placebo, and there are side effects from using these products. And in the waiting room, the women are hearing, these products are unproven, they may not be safe. I'm not taking my products, and why are you? Because you can get everything from the study without exposing yourself, and people are going to think you're positive if you take these. And so when I look at it now, I think, why in the world did we ever imagine, ever imagine, that given the difficulties with getting people who are HIV infected to take daily products and to remain virally suppressed, that these women would actually decide that this was going to be something they could really participate in. And so it's very, very different from what we saw with the 37-year-old serodiscordant couples who'd been together for an average of whatever seven years that were in the partner's prep study. Those were couples where they knew, who had an average, I think, of three kids together, who knew their partner was infected. For these young women, it made no sense. And so I actually am not, um, I think, apologizing at all. I think voice taught us so much that we should have known but didn't know. And I will say for us um, the implications were pretty clear that the low adherence um, was the reason that voice failed to show an effect and that the reasons for low product use were really complicated. They were um, the investigational status of the product, the side effects, the stigma, the rumors, but clearly women were more engaged in this trial than they were with the use of these HIV prevention products. And that self-report was an incredibly poor predictor <laughs> of use, and that social and behavioral science has been critical to understanding what happened in voice. And I think these insights have helped us really change the way we do business. For me, the big lessons were we need to pay a lot more attention to rumors and what's being said in the waiting rooms. We've learned that those are little hotbeds of misinformation. That we need to bring participants together more to talk about adherence challenges and rumors, and we've started doing that. We now, in our current studies, bring these, we have social events, they're like Film Fridays or um, monthly events at the sites where we actually select participants to come in and, and talk very openly. There's some fun components, but also some components about what they're hearing about. We need to clearly engage participants more in the role of the product um, and not just the study itself. We also heard that there were these huge waiting times. People sat in the clinics a long time between the different spots where they'd go for their adherence counseling to their HIV test to their pelvic exam. And this was when they were sitting there getting bored and coming up with excellent rumors, um, and they told us very clearly, can you stop asking us the same damn question five different ways? Don't do that, people. <laughs> that, that was one of the things. They said, don't, you know, don't ask us on a Cassie and then an interview and then ask us and ask us, because basically all they did was figure out how to tell us the same thing, uh, the same answer by back calculating. And they, we also learned that if we're really going to do this, we have to measure product adherence in real time so that you don't end up tanking a huge study based on um, something that clearly people aren't using. So I just want to give a quick shout out to Voice C and Voice D study teams, Arian Vander Stratton, and um, who, along with Jonathan Stadler, led Voice C, and, and then along with uh, Elizabeth Montgomery and Barb Mensch, uh, leading Voice D, and they've both been tremendously uh, important studies. So to me, the voice study is an example of how everything can be done right. We did stakeholder engagement. We had community input. We had integration of social science. We paid attention to emerging data from the counseling uh, work that was done in IPRAX. We had outstanding recruitment, outstanding retention. Everything looked great but it's also an example of what can go wrong because there was participant disengagement with the product. We didn't pay enough attention to waiting room rumors and discussions. And really it completely changed the way we did business. So I'm going to talk to you about what we're doing now and how that happened. So we got this information. Um, we were, um, this, the, it was presented in 2013, the uh, voice results, but we've really only gotten some of this data over the past year. But about a year ago, 
we a year and a half ago we actually just completely retooled everything um, for the other studies we're doing. So the depivirine ring, which is what's pictured here, it's a silicone rubber ring impregnated with uh, depivirine, which is a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. This is a ring that you put in the vagina and it releases the drug really slowly for over a month and essentially is the thing that's in late phase trials. Well, when we saw these data and we realized how poor adherence was, we knew right away we had to do something different. And at the same time, we were getting ready to do MTN-017, the phase two rectal study. So just to give you a little background about these ring studies, there's two of them. There's one called IPM-027, which is fully enrolled. It's about 2,000 women. It's being done by the International Partnership for microbicides, and then there's the MTN20 or Aspire study, which has 2,629 in participants enrolled. We just finished this spring, and we will be done uh, with the study about next June, and we'll have the results maybe in about a year from right now. So there are lots of different um, other studies that are ongoing to support the reading licensure program, but these are the two big ones. Uh, we, as I mentioned, are looking at the uh, safety in adolescents and postmenopausal women. So it's a huge endeavor. There's almost uh, four, there's about 4,000 women, a little over 4,000 women in these two uh, ring studies. And we are affecting this, uh, evaluating the safety and effectiveness of these, um, of these rings. And what are we learning? Well, we are learning that rings, unlike gels or pills, everybody knows how to put in a gel and everybody knows how to swallow a pill. When you show people a ring, they look at it and go, hmm, you know, not necessarily you don't think that's something I want to put in my vagina. And so you have to really talk about it a lot more. So we've found that when you introduce a ring, it's a really new technology in these study populations. But what we find is that at first people are, they think it looks too big or they think it looks pretty strange or that it's going to be uncomfortable or that it's going to fall out. But once they try it for the first month, they're always still a little bit nervous it's going to fall out. But then after that, it gets a lot better. So as opposed to gels and tablets, which have, people don't have nervousness about starting initiation, there's a lot of problems with initiation with ring. But then they get very comfortable because you said it and you forget it, more or less. And so it's been really, really very, very different. We've also found that most women report they can't feel the ring during sex. And it's really interesting when men find it in the vagina during sex and they say, I don't want that in there. They go in the bathroom, say they took it out, but don't really take it out. Then they come back and they go, that's much better. <laughs> or, and so we, I hear that over and over again in the interviews. It's really hysterical. And they just think it's hysterical. But you can tell the participants are just loving that. Um, it's, um, I can tell you this, that we know adherence is much higher than with, uh, based on daily use products. But I'm going to tell you, we are not taking any chances with this particular study. <laughs> Because um, we understand that effective products aren't effective if they're not used. And so we're paying really close attention to women who miss visits because if they don't come in, they can't get another ring. But we are doing three things biomedically to monitor adherence. We're measuring plasma depivirine levels across the site. So we don't look at individual participants. But across the site, we look at, because it's a double-blinded randomized study, we can look across the site and look at what level of adherence it is. And we're doing it based on those blood draws, but we're also getting the rings back and we send them to a lab in South Africa where they grind them up, extract what's left of depivirine in the ring. So that tells you over time how much is gone. Doesn't tell you what they do on any one day. So we're putting those two kinds of data, data together and then we're asking them, are you using it or not? Although I have to tell you, I've gotten to be very skeptical of self-report in general. <laughs> so, um, so we've been essentially every month we have these calls where we sit and look at this data. And so we, we look at the residual drug level data versus the plasma data very highly correlated. We look at the drug levels across sites. We, one of the things we've been working on were in the final six months, are people going to stop now, get a little bit more careless? But actually, I will tell you um, that adherence in this study at the very worst, at the very worst sites was around 60%. And at overall now, we're above 85. 
So it's, and don't tell NIH I told you that, but anyway, but it's, it's very high. And so we know now, but so what we did is when we got data back from particular sites, you could see, like, obviously there might be a problem in the waiting rooms in those areas, and we really focused more uh, attention on having uh, ad events for the participants at those sites. So we've recalibrated our adherence measures. We've reapproached participant engagement. Um, we've uh, adjusted site enrollment targets, um, and essentially we've uh, selected some sites that we said a priori we think these sites are problematic and we're not going to include them in the primary uh, statistical analysis plan. And all of those things are, I guess, what you would say is we've done a behavioral biomedical adaptive design. Um, but I think that's actually quite beautiful. Um, and we're, you know, we at the same time are preserving the integrity of post-randomization data. But it's really, I think, made people very engaged, a lot more engaged. What you find is if you work in a large clinical trial setting, there's like a million patients, they're lined up there every day, you have to do all your pelvic exams, and people got a little, the staff actually got a little disengaged, I think, in some cases. And this whole thing of, re, of uniting the participants and the staff around this adherence thing has been, I think, a real change in the way we've done things. And I'm going to call on Alex in a minute to talk about what they're doing in 17, because that's also been quite interesting. So the, the sister study um, is ongoing, and they're doing exactly the same stuff as us. You know, um, they essentially have been able to um, change the way they've done business as well. And the bottom line is these two products, off of your gel and Depivirine, ring are both going to be moving forward to having these licensure packages if, in fact, it looks like they are f effective. So I'm going to skip over this because I just got the three-second sign. There we go. And spend just the last five minutes on rectal microbicides. So just to, I think everyone knows that we've been working on vaginal microbicides a lot longer. So um, the rectal agenda is a little farther behind. There was a, a phase one rectal study of tenofovir gel using the vaginal formulation. It's a, it's a little behind, I know. <laughs> You're the only one who got it, though. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, the vaginal uh, gel was tested rectally in uh, 18 men and women in Pittsburgh and Lo in Los Angeles, and it wasn't well tolerated and it indicated that we needed to modify the vaginal gel to be more rectal friendly. So this is just a quick primer on that. Essentially, if you put something that's hyperosmolar into the gut, it will suck the water out of your cells and give you diarrhea. And essentially, the hyperosmolar gel that's been used for the vaginal tenofovir that was developed by Gilead way back when was hyperosmolar and essentially caused people to have some diarrhea. So the the rectal friendly formulation, as we call it, essentially just reduced the amount of glycerin to reduce the osmolality of the gel, and that was tested in the MTN07 study, um, and it was found to be safe and well tolerated in Pittsburgh, Boston, Birmingham, and Alabama. And that was really what paved the way for the first phase two study, which is testing whether the reduced glycerin formulation of the tenofovir gel is safe and acceptable and comparing the safety and acceptability of gel, tenofovir gel used daily, tenofovir gel used rectally just before and after sex, or oral Truvada, it has enrolled 186, is that right? Is it 186? Yeah. Um, and men who have sex and transgender women. And follow-up is ongoing at sites in Peru, South Africa, Thailand, and in the U.S. That includes Boston, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, and Puerto Rico. And Alex, um, who's here with us, has been really incredibly well leading the efforts on this study. Now, what did we do different? When we were when we got the voice results, we said, you know what, we're going to include something um, real time PK monitoring. So instead of just waiting to the end we're going to actually do something which is a little crazy. We're going to collect the samples when guys come in, and then we're going to send them to the lab, see if they actually use their drug in the last interval, and get the results back to the site in time for them to talk to them. And they do something called a convergence, right? You do a convergence interview where they have what the person is reporting in their interview 
along with this data and talking through some of the peculiarities and disconnects uh, between what's found in the PK data versus what's reported by the people. And, and Pardon me? And product returns. And product returns, right. So it's putting those three pieces together. When we proposed it, um, people said, there's no way you're going to get this done. There's no way you can turn samples around that fast and get the data back so that you can do this in real time. But we are actually doing it. And it actually, I think, has completely enriched the study. Don't you think, Alex? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, the first time it's been done. Um, and it really has absolutely, I think, made this made the, this product and this study way more really excited about it. So we're um, expecting this to be completed uh, about mid next year and hopefully we'll have the results ready to release in 2016. And we're trying to figure out like where do we go next? Do we actually use a rectal formulation using a vaginal applicator which maybe isn't so great? Um, what do you do? Do you use oral prep as a comparator or do you give oral prep to everybody as a backbone? So we're doing, going to be doing some consultations on how would you even design a study like this. And at the same time, others are looking at new approaches for rectal microbicides. Um, there's two new programs. The DREAM program, which is out of uh, Baltimore, led by Craig Hendricks which is focused on creating a douche system with tenofovir as the active ingredient. And Alex, you're part of that, yes? And then the PREVENT program, which is based on a rectal specific gel containing graphitsin. This is a picture of a tobacco plant because they actually grow graphitsin in a uh, tobacco plant to make enough of this um, molecule. And it's a very, very potent antiviral that's luminally active. So those are two new programs in the rectal ar arena that I think are really exciting. So summarizing rectal microbicides, and that was really fast. Oral Truvada is certainly no silver bullet, um, but I, I really think we still need to look at other approaches like the douche. Uh, certainly a lube-like product that would be applied as a lube is something I think to look at. And we need to, um, next steps, we're thinking about a phase three study of tenofovir gel rectally, but um, that's going to be complicated. Uh, we are just going to start a safety of depivirine gel as a secondary um, backup product, and then there are these new novel products that have been designed specifically for rectal use. So last slide in the years ahead, you're going to find out whether or not tenofovir gel can be confirmed in fax 001 and will it move forward to approval with the pivoting ring, uh, possible regulatory approval. Uh, will we have a rectal microbicide phase three? And as we move forward, there are other new things, the combination products and the film products that could move forward. So it's a really exciting time, I think, in the microbicide arena. But uh, when I think about where the journey we've been on, it's, um, you know, people always, we get, I get invited to these meetings sometimes. This was a talk actually um, modified slightly from one that I gave at NIMH. But, you know, we're always getting yelled at that we need to include behavioral scientists in our protocols. And I'm like, I'm a total believer. Um, we do it from the very, very earliest stages. And it hasn't, and they're with us side by side. And I think it's been very difficult for the social and behavioral scientists to work in the, rigid constructs of regulatory studies, but I hope it's been illuminating on your side. It's certainly been incredibly critical to the success of the work we do. And so I think these partnerships outside of disciplines are pro where a lot of richness happens. And so I just wanted to give a nod to that. But I do think the future is quite promising for prevention um, as we think about where these products will fit. So thanks so much.